Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. By now, all of America, all of the world knows, of course, that Donald Trump has been intentionally separating families, including refugees, people seeking asylum in the United States of America as a policy, as a purposeful policy, thinking that maybe cruelty will keep people from coming to this country, not really understanding that um, these refugees, migrants, people seeking asylum are often escaping even greater cruelty, often certain death. He has separated the children from the parents, including infants ripped from mother's breasts and placed them in cages, oftentimes thousands of miles away from their families. And the courts have said, you can't do that, Donald Trump. And they ordered him to return the families, to return the children to their parents. Well, uh, the, the deadline was, a couple, was about a week or two ago for children under five. That wasn't met today, today. July 26th is the deadline for returning all the families, all the children, thousands of kids to their families. And the question is, is he going to comply? I think we probably know the answer. To help answer, address these questions, I have a special guest in studio. If you're watching on Facebook Live, I'll turn the camera to, to show you her. This is Claudia Flores, and she is um, what they call the immigrant campaign manager for the Campaign for American Progress. Claudia, thanks for coming here and joining Thank us you for having on the Inside me. Scoop. So today's the big day. Is this the day when we're going to see all these families uh, reunited finally? So this is the firm deadline that a federal uh, court judge um, gave to the government so they would reunite all the families that they've separated at the border. Uh, it seems unlikely that the government will meet this deadline. This is the second deadline that they failed to meet to reunite all families. And I mean, there are no other words to describe it other than this is like a cruel policy that just needs to end now. I was reading in the New York Times, um, frankly, with tears in my eyes, as these three-year-olds are trying to comfort their own parents uh, because the, the grief is so severe. And that's the ones who are reunited. It seems like half of them, is that fair to say, about 50 percent are not being re reunited, at least not yet? So based on the numbers that we know, and this comes from the government's own records in terms of their court filings, um, is that more than 900 families may not be reunited. Um, Ever. Uh, yes, we know that more than 400 parents have been deported without their children. Um, the government has not identified at least 90 plus families. Uh, they have not been identified, the parents with their children. So we are talking about a total of probably over 3,000 families that have been separated as a result of zero tolerance. 3,000 families, so 3, that's families. more children. Yeah, so 3,000 so children. maybe 4,000. Yeah, children. it goes between 3,000 and 4,000. And, and granted, I mean, these numbers are coming from the government. Um, we know that the ACLU, which has brought forth the lawsuit on behalf of these separated parents, is asking for more information specific to these numbers. It hasn't been a transparent process. But from what we know right now is that the government, by today, needs to reunify at least more than 2,000 kids with their parents. By midnight tonight? Yes. Now, Claudia, the judge, who, by the way, is a a George Bush appointed judge. This is not some some wonderful liberal judge that, that you and I would really like, but is a reasonable person. Um, really berated the government at the hearing that occurred, I guess, a, almost a month ago now. He said, uh, you keep better track of money. You keep better track of someone's wallet, someone's possessions than you do their children. The obvious implication being that your daughter, your son is more important to you than your wallet or your umbrella. Um, and he angrily demanded, correct me if I'm wrong, that every single child be accounted for and every parent be accounted for. Am I right that that was the judge's order? And am I right that it hasn't been complied with? So the judge was very clear. The judge said that this, these were firm deadlines. Um, it gave a first deadline of July 10th to reunite kids under five. So we are talking about babies, right? We're talking about kids from zero to five that needed to be reunified. The government failed to reunify close to 50 kids. Um, these are kids that out of about have, 100 uh, out of or, about 100 from what we know so almost um, half yes and then the government had the nerve to argue that you know they needed more time that you know some of these parents were um, apparently at risk for their kids but you know from the stories and from what we capture and from the great work of journalists what we are seeing is that the government had no clear plan to reunify these families so it's really problematic and not that, that they not have a clear plan to, to reunify the families 
They apparently didn't even monitor where they went. They don't even know where they are. They release parents uh, apparently without um, giving them notice about where their kids were. We have seen that the reunification process has been chaotic. It has been slow. In fact, there's been a group of volunteers that are helping families with flights. I mean, we've heard stories of kids who are waiting in parking lots for their parents. I mean, this is this is not how things should work, and especially not when the government has, you know, chosen this policy and made that um, the United States official policy uh, to separate these families. So, you know, I think we need to hold folks accountable, but we need to also, um, you know, own up to this responsibility that, you know, you you took these kids from their parents and you had no plan to reunify them. And now we are going to have to see where we're at in a few days, uh, how many more stories we're going to hear of parents that, you know, were coerced into signing documents to be deported with other kids. I mean, it, it's been horrible. This. So we know that still more than 2,000 kids are still, as of today, the day when they're supposed to all be reunited, every last one of them, more than 2,000 are still separated from their parents. Is that right? So the, so the numbers have you know, been, been changing depending on, on, I guess if you asked me a day ago, it was 2,000. Now the government says that they reunify like 1,000. So um, you know, the reality is that more than 3,000 kids have been separated. So what we know is that by today, those numbers should be high. What we are hearing from the litigators in this case is that the government will likely not meet the deadline once again. I'm sure that's true. I'm just kind of trying to figure out the scope of it all. How, help me out here. Mm -hmm. When a child is separated from their parents, I, I, it, the most gruesome case that I read about was literally a baby torn from her mother's breast. I mean, while nursing. I mean, it, 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 and the child refused to eat for several days thereafter. The mother right. uh, uh, was not well either. Um, so the child's ripped away from the parents. What then happens? How do they decide where the child goes, where the parents go? Is there any kind of due process here? There's that famous image that I think will probably define the, the Donald Trump presidency of the two or three-year-old girl crying, uh, looking up at the man crying. There's another famous video, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you've heard audio actually, where uh, the, the children cry and, and, and the immigration authority, the ICE authority mocks the child for mocks a preschool child for crying that her parents are taken away. Um, <laughs> and don't know if that guy got any discipline. So, so once this cruelty happens, they're actually separated. What happens next? Where do they go? Is there any, or, I mean, is it just, Hey, I hear there's a place we can send them to in Idaho. I, is it, is it that random? So, so, so here what's happening, right? So, so the family separations are a direct result of the administration's zero tolerance policy. Right. So back in April, attorney general sessions um, announced that we were going to criminally prosecute every single person who crossed the Southwest borders without documentation. These includes asylum seekers. So what that means is that for parents that were coming with minor children, they were ripped apart, like you've described, so that the parents could then fall under the custody of the U.S. Marshals. He also said, by the way, that the domestic violence was not just considered um, an appropriate reason to run. Apparently, you're just supposed to die if you're under a threat of domestic violence or gang violence. He didn't care about that. Um, so, so just to be clear, these are people, many of them literally trying to save their lives and the lives of their children. Yeah, and, and you know, and all these changes that, that we are seeing that are making it more difficult for asylum and refugees to be able to um, access the protections that they are, you know, entitled to. I mean, the reality Under is the that seeking asylum um, is a lawful process. Um, what is going on with these family separations is that even at ports of entry, parents are presenting themselves asking for help with documents that they are the parents of these children. Uh, I mean, before they get to present their claims, they are being arrested and detained. And, you know, um, when it comes to the kids, kids fall under the custody of the Health and Human Services, HHS, under the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And the reason why, you know, these kids are in shelters and, and what we have seen has also been, um, you know, the result of, you know, private contractors and other people that are profiting from these policies. But, you know, there are some protections in place for these children. Um, what is wrong and, 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 and the reason why these separations have increased over the past few months is because of zero tolerance. And I think as long as the administration is still criminally charging these parents, you are going to keep seeing separations. Right now, the court order, right, has 
um, bar that, that separation from happening. But the reality is that it is the criminalization of migrants, of asylum seekers, what is really causing a lot of, of these crises. Yeah, it's funny. A lot of people, um, they use the term illegals to talk about these people um, who are trying to seek a better life here in America. And, and, and uh, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize is that immigration is a civil offense. It's not even a criminal offense. It's kind of like a parking ticket. In other words, you're, you, you, know, you can be fined, that kind of stuff, but it's, it's not a criminal offense under the law. And as you point out, seeking asylum is actually provided for under the law. To refuse to allow them to seek asylum is, is breaking the law. But I want to get back to, so parents and kids have just been separated. Mm -hmm. Child's crying, screaming, angry, of course. He doesn't know where his mommy is. Um, mom's taken, dad's taken away. What happens next? Maybe, maybe let's start with the children. Um, so the children go to HHS. Let's say you got a four-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. Where does she go? How do they decide? Do they keep records of where she goes? What do they do next? I mean, so 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 the other challenge again, it depends on you know where the child enter with the parent. I mean, there's a lot of sort of complexities uh, with this process. But um, in the beginning, what we know is that when you know families are apprehended at the border, they are typically placed in holding cells. There are limitations of how many hours at the moment together. I at the beginning together? In, in some kids. cases, yes. Um, holding cells, uh, families often describe them. These are by Customs and Border Patrol. Um, they describe them as hieleras in Spanish, which means pretty much cold fridges because the temperatures in these holding cells are so cold that many of the kids end up developing a cold, a cough, because they're-, they're Which, spent by the way, I've just got to say, you're on the border of Texas. It's July or August. It's one of the hottest places in right. the United States. It's probably 100 degrees outside and humid. So the cost to make these frigid cells, it actually costs more to the taxpayers to torture these people and turn the temperature down to 55. That, it's a lot to air condition a Texas uh, indoor facility down to 55 or whatever they're using to torture these, these people. Frankly, you'd think, if anything, they wouldn't give them enough air conditioning. It's a weird thing. It's almost sadistic, dare I say. I mean, and these are things that, you know, I have to say that a lot of the cases and, and, and the litigators that have been involved in this lawsuit, I mean, the stories that we're hearing about, you know, abuses that are happening at the hands of CBP and ICE from, um, you know, racial slurs to uh, instances of harassment and abuse. I mean, these families have gone already through a lot to come to the United States. Sure. And the fact that we are seeing these abuses is just as problematic. But in terms of process, um, you know, these children have to be referred to ORR for their own protection. Um, to OR, the Office, uh, of, the office of Refugee Resettlement. So one of the things that the government has tried to mo modify, and a, a federal judge actually rejected it, is the so-called Flores Settlement, which has become um, a um, you know, it's been it's been a focus on on recent news, um, and this you know well, that's been around twenty years. The floor, so yes, it's been since the eighties, and this was a case that was brought forth because you know minor kids were being abused, they were being placed in you know um, motels that were you know they became detention centers overnight, and you know you had cases of kids and adults in the same rooms, and you know pools that were empty to hold the kids. So these were abuses that happened in the 80s that were shameful that the government was sued for. And then the parties came to an agreement, to a consent decree um, known as Flores. And Flores placed standards for the conditions of confinement for children. What are those standards? So some of those standards refer to the length of time. So kids cannot be held for more than 20 days um, under the government custody in in, in facilities, right, that um, that in this case is, would be jails, right, or detention centers. Is, is, that, is that anyone under 18 when you say children? Uh, yes, a minor, so okay, under 18. Okay, so if you're 17 so, years old, you cannot, under the law in the United States of America, be held more than 20 days. You shouldn't. Unless I mean, you've committed a, another crime or something. You've done, you know, you killed someone or something. That would be different, but, but that's an exception. If you yeah. haven't done anything other than enter the country without documents, you shouldn't be held more than 20 days if you're under 18. Right. So so that so is... So it sounds like the Trump administration has already violated Flores. So, so they are trying to modify Flores, which a judge denied, um, because they were also trying to hold these kids with their parents in detention. And that wasn't the solution that we wanted. And that's what, when the president issued this executive order, he said, you know, I've ended family separation. But what he, in fact, did was replace family separation with family detention. So, 
um, you know, um, I've got to take a break. Sure. I'm, afraid I'm running up against a hard deadline. So uh, we'll be right back. If you want to call in, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-488-6275. We'll be right back right after this. He's a Bible-quoting, Constitution-loving, flag-waving, red-blooded, liberal American. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. So just so you're aware, Claudia, we are being recorded on Facebook. Okay. We're not on the radio at the moment. Okay. But just be aware that... Got it. Okay. So just Sounds let you know good. that. Yeah, yeah, no worries. And you know, <laughs> not I, that you're, I, I, not I, that you're I, gonna no, say anything no, particularly no. revealing. I mean, I was, you both are sounding great, guys. Um, can you stay a little bit longer? They said um, only 30 so, minutes. So I but... can stay longer. I mean, I think um, I will probably like to underscore, you know, how many families will probably not be reunited. No, 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 no. We got so a lot more to talk like about. That. I want to keep you. Now, we, I'm here the whole hour. I don't know if you take the whole hour, but mm-hmm. originally you just said the half hour, and I feel like we've just gotten started. So <laughs> uh, if you could stay longer, I'd sure. appreciate it. Great. Great, great. Um, I actually ran way over this segment because I was – usually I, I look at it myself, and um, but I had the camera focused on you, so I couldn't see the clock. Uh, I no. could tell Mark you were engaged because I'm like Mark never goes as long in well, this I, segment. I didn't, I didn't so. have the clock yeah. that's a testament. That's a Facebook, testament to Cla- to Claudia, I yeah. think too. Well, Facebook was um, I was on, I was, had the camera on her, so <laughs> I didn't have I didn't have my you know other clock. Everything's back. sounding good though. So on my Facebook. guess is this next segment is going to be like what a minute, maybe not. Even, about ninety seconds. 90 so if you want to just okay. do a like maybe let her finish her point and then you yeah, know just, just let her know seconds. that. And then after the half gonna, hour, we'll yeah. have another long segment. Uh, folks, if you want to call in, our phones are now working. Thank God. 888 mark 888 You can ask a question of me or of Claudia. Or um, I can see many of you in Facebook. If you want to leave a question there, you can do that as well. And they can follow Claudia on Twitter at, what is it, C-L-A-U-D-S-D-C. Is that right, Claudia? That's correct. Claude's. Claude's. C-L-A-U-D-S. I like it. It's cool. Next thing you know, she's going to be claiming Flores is because of her family. She got she got that settlement passed. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jenny Flores was, you know, the, the the plaintiff in this case. And, you know, a lot of people are, you know, quick to jump into conclusions about what Flores is. And, you know, I'm not an attorney myself, but just from reading the history of the Flores case and why it was brought forth, you know, Imagine if we didn't have it. I mean, you would see yeah. more abuses. No, I, and, you're such a serious um, person. I just meant that that was your last name. That's all. <laughs> no, no, no. I hear you. But, you know, <laughs> I have I these meant. conversations was, with friends. No, no, no. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, you know, I have this conversation with friends because, you know, I, I've done immigration policy work mm-hmm. in the past and I've worked with both Republicans and Democrats. And I can tell you that, you know, for some reason, you know, there's sometimes hyper-partisanship, you know, is creating a sense of blindness where if we can't agree on kids, you know, what, this is what? really good stuff, but you realize you're just on Facebook now. You're not on the radio yet. So save it. We'll, we'll get back to you. Yeah, I promise. definitely. I mean, you could say it twice. Uh, yeah. The Facebook audience will hear it twice. But uh, yeah, and, and the I mean, radio audience is in a commercial. No, right no, now. you're. I mean, it's great that people are engaged. And, you know, I've been yeah. telling folks, I, um, you know, I, I worked with my conda um, a couple of years ago. And, you know, he was, uh, he's the son of, um, you know, Japanese um uh, Japanese parents who were in internment intern, camps yeah. and he was interned himself in Colorado and just having conversations of people that were impacted by past policies. I mean, the power that the government has over um, the right for these families to feel safe and to, you know, be able to access the protections that they're allowed to. I mean, yeah, that, we actually gave, I'm sure you know mm-hmm. this, we gave reparations to the families uh, who were interned in World War II, the Japanese American families. And it's considered this big, horrible, dark blot on American history. Uh, And all I can ever think about is, hey, at least they were interned together. I mean, this is far worse than that. Here is this terrible stain on American history, and this is worse than that. I mean, and and in that case, I think, you know, they they went after citizens. And I think it's important to recognize that, that, you know, there were people that due to politics of fear and the state of of war that we were, I mean, these were people that were targeted because of their race. And I That's think right. to some extent, these families, you know, the fact that, you know, many of them, you know, were not aware of their rights. I mean, when we are hearing stories of some of these deportations, these were parents that were basically told to waive their rights to their own children. Right. Hold on, we're coming back. Mm-hmm. And now the voice of reason Ready, Mark? in an unreasonable Ready. world, Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Today is the day that a federal judge has ordered the federal government to comply with the law. He has ordered the Donald Trump administration and ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, to return 
thousands of children to their parents. And preliminary indications are pretty clear. They ain't going to follow the order. They're going to follow with some, maybe half, but a lot of children will not be reunited. And in some cases, the Trump administration is saying, ah, I guess these kids will never be returned to their parents. Oh, well. Oh, well. You know, I think back to kidnapping, right? How would Donald Trump feel if one of his grandchildren were kidnapped? I mean, that's what this is. To say that you're going to take away the child and never let him or her see their parents again. Some of these kids are six months old, nine months old. They can't advocate for themselves. They may not know their own name. They may not know the names of their parents. And if they've misplaced where the kids are, where the parents are, how the heck are they going to reunite them? We're going to come back for a much longer segment in uh, just a few minutes with my guest. Her name is Claudia Flores. She is the immigration campaign manager, you might call her, for the campaign for the center, excuse me, the Center for American Progress, which is where we sit in Washington, D.C. If you want to call in, it's 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. Please call. We'll be right back right after this. My name is... See, I went so far over in the first segment that the second segment was like... So for those of you who really want to know how radio <laughs> works, the half hour is, is actually a hard break. The, the uh, middle portion, I actually have a little play with it, but mm-hmm. I went so much longer. That I mean, it, it's hard to condense immigration law and no, all understand. these policies. And- so we have a half hour left. This is, mm-hmm. this is the uh, overtime, the uh, halftime time. Um, what do you want to get across the next half hour? What's what's would you maybe tell some individual stories if you have some. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to families. share. I, I think sometimes numbers, 2,000, 3,000, right. doesn't have as much impact as sharing a story of one little girl, one little boy or two. I mean, I think, again, journalists have played a huge role in this from, you know, trying to show up in, in court where these mass prosecutions were happening mm-hmm. in the beginning. I mean, what you saw were, um, you know, parents that were in shackles in courts being mass prosecuted and you know for the only crime of coming to this country to give a better life to the children right. so so just so you know again we're not on radio at the moment <laughs> it's very powerful what you're saying i just i'm just sort of having a meta conversation no, with you about what you want to talk about so we'll talk about individual examples um and um i do want to get sort of a feel for the process like what it looks like to a three-year-old child or seven-year-old child you know what they're told maybe get into some of the waivers the parents were forced to sign. But from their own perspective, many of them don't speak English, many of them are escaping violence, sort of how it looks through their eyes. And then maybe talk um, about, I want to end, this is probably the last segment of what the court can do or should do with non-compliant federal officials. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, can we hold them in contempt? Can we throw the president in jail? Can we deport him? Because I really think (laughs) if we could deport him, um, you know, uh, I hate to deport Melania, though she probably wasn't here. She probably was undocumented herself, uh, but uh, she's really not the one I want to punish. Um, anyway, we'll be right back in just a minute, folks. And I think what I hear sometimes from friends is that, you know, my family did things the right way mm-hmm. and, you know, I came here lawfully. But you have to think that, you know, the reason why the executive branch was given power over immigration is because Congress recognized that they had, um, you know, that that immigration changed very quickly and it would change so quickly that Congress might not be able to react on time. So, so, so there is a reason why, you know, we've seen a lot of these changes. And frankly, if, you know, families were coming under the standards and policies that the administration is setting, you know, many of us wouldn't be here. It would be extremely difficult for, Families. Well, my understanding is mm-hmm. it's immigration's down. That actually we have fewer people crossing the border than we've had in, in past years. And that, that that trend occurred even before Trump became president. So so yeah, so so I think the difference here is that, you know, th- this administration is manufacturing crisis. In my sense is that they're doing that because that allows them to advance a political agenda, sure. whether that is, you know, advocating to end these crucial protections for children, whether it's modifying flores and a whole list of things that frankly come from all these anti-immigrant nativist groups. I, I would go further. I don't think it's about just um, 
uh, not liking undocumented immigrants or even not liking immigrants. I think it's about fear of certain racist white people that the demographics of this country are changing and they can't handle having an America that is no longer a majority white country. Now, you don't have to say that. I said it. <laughs> but um, I see it when I see the way that this is being done. Um, some half of the undocumented immigrants don't come across the border. They overstay their visas. They come in planes. They come. Some come from Canada, but most are just flying in and overstaying. And I just don't see any enforcement for white undocumented immigrants. I just haven't seen much of it. So that's just my back side point for the Facebook audience. Progressive. Mark Levine. Ready, Mark? Ready. Here you go. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Today is the deadline by which the Trump administration has been ordered to return all of the thousands of children ripped away from their parents at the border by the Trump policy of intentional cruelty. The idea is if you're really, really cruel to people who are escaping violence, that they'll go back in and go back to that violence. Um, and apparently even this sadistic cruelty isn't really working. People still want to live. And um, anyway, the judge has ordered them all to be returned and all indications are it's not gonna happen, at least not for maybe as many as half of them. My guest today is Claudia Flores. She's sitting right with me in studio. This is actually her office. Uh, we're at the Center for American <laughs> Progress, where I do my show every day. Uh, and she works here every day. Um, Claudia, before the break, we were talking about what it's like. Because understanding, I mean, frankly, I don't completely understand our immigration system. And I'm sure that a three-year-old child has no idea what's going on. We've even seen cases, which are shocking to me, where a two or three-year-old is brought to the courtroom without a parent right. and without a lawyer, and the judge says to the kid, hey, you know, how do you plead? And he says, coloring book? I mean, it's, 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 it would be funny if it weren't so darkly serious. What, take me, if you can, let's try to go into the eyes of a three-year-old, a seven-year-old, a 12-year-old, whatever, a child, doesn't speak English, escaping violence with their family, told they're going to try to seek a better life in America, and what, suddenly their parents are whisked away? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the story that I was reading right before coming on, on your show today. So um, as I was mentioning, there are more than 900 parents that the government has deemed ineligible to reunite. Um, more than 400 of these are parents that may have been deported without their children who have waived their rights. Uh, right now, with the lawsuit, uh, there are some stories coming up about parents that did not understand the documents that were signing. But there's a story that, that, that caught my eye, and that is of a three-year-old girl who came with her grandmother. Um, so her mom had fled violence with a young son um, a couple years ago, um, and, and the grandmother um, you know, brought the child. And one of the things that the Trump administration is saying that if you're not a parent, um, you know, you can't, um, they can't give you a child if, if you're not identified as a parent. And in this case, you know, this grandmother has raised this child. Um, she actually suffered a stroke, which the family mm -hmm. believes from all the stress from coming here, being separated. Mm -hmm. um, and that little girl from um, PBS actually covers the story is still, it is my understanding, in a shelter. And, um, you know, from the limited conversations she's been able to have with her mother and, and the grandmother, you know, she is asking, you know, mommy, come get me. And, you know, that story, um, knowing that, you know, some of the, the you know, the, the parents that, that the administration has forcefully removed from their kids, I mean, it's just horrendous, like, um, you know, stories of kids not recognizing their parents, parents missing, you know, a first birthday, first baby steps. I mean, it, it, it's it's horrendous, I think. And um, from what I understand is 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 in the, in the pictures I've seen, and a lot of times they, they refuse to allow the press to enter. They've even refused members of Congress to enter. And um, my view is if you won't let the press or members of Congress see what's going on, then it's probably even worse than we imagine. But the pictures I've seen are of pretty small cages, kids sleeping on concrete with these, I guess, mylar blankets. I call them a blanket is really, um, I mean, could they really not find blankets? Is that so hard? Can't they go to hospital? They have these like almost aluminum foil sheets, um, which can't be very comfortable. It really sounds like the intent is to torture the children, torture the parents to make them as miserable as possible. 
I mean, the uh, do, do you think that there's a little bit of that going on here? So, so the administration, um, you know, said it very clearly when they announced the zero tolerance policy that it was meant for deterrence, so that other families couldn't come. And what we have done here well, at we the don't center, treat killers like that. <laughs> Kill, if we're, we, you know, we put people in prison to deter them from committing crimes, right? Robbery or murder or, what, or to punish them for crimes. We don't deny them blankets. We don't put them on a concrete floor, and there are not three. In fact, you're not allowed to try someone for murder at the, under the age of, of a certain age, seven or ten. We, we don't torture children. Frankly, we shouldn't be torturing adults. And there was a huge argument about how we treated you know, grown terrorists. Whatever you feel about that argument, this is a three-year-old girl. I mean, why hasn't there I, – there's been a lot of outcry from you and me, a lot of liberals. I haven't heard a lot of outcry from Republicans, from conservatives, from so-called Christians, so-called evangelicals, people who supposedly believe – in children, the pro-life community, right? They really, really want to stop a woman from having an abortion, but torture a three-year-old child, put her on a cold concrete floor and, uh, you know, and take her away from her parents. I don't hear these Christian evangelical leaders speaking out. I mean, am I missing something? I mean, I, I, I think- I'm, A few are, I'm sure. I mean, I, I think what's going on, in, in, and really this is part of the politics of fear and division that this administration has carried out since the beginning, is that, you know, this level of hyper-partisanship has often led to, you know, people to decide to purposely blind themselves to the issues and say, you know, I'm not going to engage. This is immigration. Um, it doesn't affect me. But the reality is that it affects all of us. I mean, economically speaking, um, you know, the num the amount of taxpayer money that is going into these processes, I mean, part well, yeah, of it's expensive it, to it, do it, this it, much torture. It, like it, I it's... said, the, even the air conditioning in a Texas hot summer, it costs money to be this cruel. And at the same time, you know, you have private contractors that are benefiting from these government policies. And if you look at how much, you know, money and billions of dollars, the private prison industry is receiving from jailing more immigrants and all these policies that the attorney general sessions has rolled out you know it's a profitable business and we are profiting our families and that is wrong um i wish to see congress do more they do have oversight power um, but i also think that you know we are entering a midterm election and i think it's very important to realize that you know people have the power to vote out those representatives that are not standing up for american values and in my opinion i think you know, this is an issue that has really struck a core into our nations. Um, uh, you know, in, in all the households, I mean, I've seen parents, you know, telling me, you know, how do you do this work? And, and, and I'm not an attorney, and I've heard stories of attorneys who, you know, they simply can't understand, you know, why we are inflicting so much harm on these families. So um, all of these facilities, the children, they're – Days they're confused. They they don't know what's going on. It's just horrible and miserable. What about the parents? I mean, they raised this child from birth to age seven, and now their seven year old boy is just gone, and they're being deported to El Salvador. And even if they make it back to the border, they don't know whether their son is in Colorado or New Hampshire or Georgia or Nebraska. Are they being told when someone comes back and says, where is my child? Are they told? So, you know, fathers and mothers that have been interviewed and have been able to get access to attorneys, um, you know, they describe the abuses from um, the ICE ones officers. who have access to attorneys. What percentage have access to attorneys? I mean, it, it's very low. It depends on location. It depends on, you know, the 10 percent, 20 percent. It would be hard for me to, to give you a figure but it's, today. It's, but it's I, less than half. To be sure. I mean, so so the government is not required to 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 give um, uh, um, in in this case uh, government sponsor uh, representation uh, to immigrants. But what we know is that there are you know projects um, that is the ECU, the Florence Project. I mean, there's a whole group of organizations that have been trying to deal with this crisis by providing attorney representation. Um, and you know what is going on is that it's it's been a manipulative effort from officers within facilities who you know tell these parents you know you might not see your kid again or i need you to sign this form and you can only imagine these parents trying to deal with their own legal cases and, and some thinking, of them probably think if they sign the form they'll see their kids again when in actuality signing the form waves all their rights and they're also right and, and, and they're also given no a word for it and they're also given a false choice between 
you know, choosing um, in some cases that we're seeing now come out in the news that parents were told, you know, um, you know, self-deport and, you know, your child can stay and, 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 and you know, some parents, uh, you know, the indication is that they've signed forms not understanding that they were waiving their rights, but some of them were doing that thinking, you know, at least if my child is safe, which speaks to why these parents are coming here and they are coming to protect their children. So if you have a child, let's say you have a 12-year-old girl, and let's say she's sexually assaulted, she's raped by an ICE officer, just the worst case thing. She doesn't speak English. How's she going to complain? She's going to complain to the guy who raped her? Is, is, is there no, I mean, you can, we've heard stories of abuses. And my guess is that these prisoners, these children, they can be unlimitedly mistreated and have no access to anyone. They can't make phone calls. They can't have lawyers. They can't call their parents. They're in the mercy of people who would abuse them with no rights whatsoever. A a a am, I am I missing something? So, here? so, so they, they, they have constitutional rights, and I would argue that. What other constitutional rights? Um, so, so the Constitution does not uh, is not based on on citizenship. The Constitution right. makes it clear that all, all persons. people, all persons, right. Um, so, so the right, I would say that the the right to dignity, that that the right to to be able to to but be how safe do they from exercise danger. That right? So, so, so the accountability part, um, and that's I think what you're getting at. So, what we have seen so far, one of the challenges, so detention facilities don't comply with PRIA standards with which prisons what, do what, federal what's, prisons. Pr what's PRIA standards? so uh, PRIA comes from the Prison Rape Elimination Act and these Thank are you. basic standards that federal prisons have to comply to prevent instances of abuse harassment assault um, and there are very clear standards that um, they have not been implemented um, and because of that the research after research and study after study shows that abuses are rampant in detention. Um, and, you know, the other challenging now, now, part... Now, as the government said, we don't have to obey PREA standards, Prison Rape Elimination Act. I mean, this is a law, and as you point out, the Constitution does apply to all persons have the right to due process under the law. Has, is this being challenged in the courts? What, what's what's so, happening so, here? So the other challenging with immigration and, and why our, our system is so broken is that there are also private contractors that are in charge of these facilities. So it's very you know, difficult and the government has not done a great job at holding these con contracts are accountable. So for instance, you know, some of these centers are ran by, you know, uh, the GEO group, um, Core Civic, former corporations, uh, uh, of, uh, Corrections Corporation of America, and places that are making billions of dollars out of uh, imprisoning people. And the reality is that they're not, you know, they, they get contract after contract. Um, there are abuses that are documented. I mean, Eloy, for instance, in Arizona is notorious for its abuses. So are other p facilities. Um, um, you know, Dilly was a facility, a family uh, residential, that's what they call it, a family detention facility that had to close because it didn't meet some of the state standards. And I mean, it, it, it seems enough. like on immigration. I want to see the people who run these prisons. I want to see them in prison um, because uh, some fine or some closure, that's not enough, obviously, to prevent these abuses. And, and I think they take advantage of the fact that, you know, they keep giving these contracts and they're you know, children and they don't speak uh, English. Who's easier to abuse? And they have no right to lawyers or their parents. It just I mean, it's 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 absolutely rife. It's 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 like it's frankly it reminds me, I hate to say it, but the days of slavery, because p masters could mistreat their slaves and their slaves had no recourse. Who are they going to complain to? No one. Uh, these people, what are they going to do? Call 911? They don't have phones. They don't have, they don't know the system. They don't have even access to lawyers. It's really scary. I mean, and, and what people need to understand too is that, you know, the prolonged detention of migrants is, is commonplace. And, and that is something that, you know, people that are held in these facilities, you know, have to deal with the uncertainty of not knowing when they're going to be, um, you know, released in some cases. You know, there are instances where they're deported. They've you know, they're switched from facility to facility overnight. So the mistreatment of immigrants who are confined, um, you know, has been uh, very clearly outlined by many of the groups that have been doing this work for a year, but the government has failed to comply. Um, and I hope, you know, that this issue of family separation, which, you know, it seems like it's, it's breaking through, you know, sheds light into other issues that are, you know, impacted immigrants on a day-by-day -day basis. I mean, the number of immigrants that are being deported without any criminal convictions. I mean, that's huge. That is alarming. You're talking about... I mean, that didn't know, used to happen. That's uh, new under Trump. So the, the Obama administration had um, enforcement priorities. 
um, the Trump administration in the beginning issued an executive order that made every single undocumented person a target for deportation. Um, and that is why you are seeing more people in communities across America be targets of this administration, even people that have tried to adjust status. I mean, we've heard stories and, and seen cases um, of, you know, parents that are going for, in some cases, uh, an interview to adjust their status, uh, whether it's through naturalization or other um, forms of protection. And, you know, they are detained there. And, 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 and those abuses, I mean, Communities are literally being torn apart by yeah. these policies. Well, in Virginia, people were actually uh, in a church. They waited outside the church until they came out. Uh, these supposed good Christians who are uh, taking people out of church. And uh... All right, I got to take one more break, Claudia. But when we come back, I want to talk about what we can do about it. I want to know the full gamut, what the courts can do. I want to know when, when the Trump administration doesn't comply today, what the court can and should do to make the government comply. I want to know what we as American citizens and immigrants and as a community can do to rise up to help these people. You know, do we take to the streets? Help me out. Let the listeners know what they can do, places to donate anything. We'll be right back. 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. He's a Harvard economist and a Yale lawyer. He does not keep up with the Kardashians. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now no, at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. I, I think one's Chloe. It all start with a K. Kim, Kim, I guess. Kim, I guess I've heard of Kim. <laughs> I know nothing about the Kardashians. And I really don't care to know anything about the Kardashians. Hi, this is John Andrasik of Five for Five. That was sort of the point of that. that uh, Oh, so let's see what people are writing on Facebook here. I'll just read for you some of the comments that sure. we're getting on Facebook. Thanks for talking about this important show with this knowledgeable and informative guest. Disgracefully, private prisons are the biggest industry in the western part of Virginia. How many kids' jails do we know have been set up? Thanks for – okay. Um, although administrative law immigration judges are not going to be legal high flyers, how could they associate themselves with this affront to human rights and denial of due process? Why don't they insist that three-year-olds have a lawyer, a responsible adult, or friend to help them? Don't these people have children? Well, why can't they all resign? Um, one person writes, there are some important uh, examples. Let me read this. Uh, points out that there are churches that are speaking out, the Presbyterian Church, United Church of Christ. Yes, yes, I know those are liberal churches, and I'm glad they're speaking out, and I'm glad those are real Christians. But let me tell you, the evangelicals, the Trumpists, the people that um, support him, the people that are crowing all the time about forcing poor women and raped women to have children, they don't seem to care about the actual children. They do seem to love the embryos, though. Um, so you're right, Henry. Yes, liberal churches are standing up, and I'm grateful that they are liberal, mainstream religious groups all across the country. But the evangelical community is not acting very Christian, in my humble opinion. It's the again, it would be ironic if it weren't just sad. All right, we have one last segment, folks. There is a chance for you to call in if someone wants to, 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. Claudia, sometimes when you're so compelling, they just sit and listen and don't call. You them. got one in the queue there, oh, Mark. Oh, we do. Oh, I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't have that up there. Who's, let me, you know what? I, I Sorry, I didn't even have that open. Who, who's in the queue? Why don't you tell me? Uh, it's Mike. Okay. I can tell him to try to be brief if you want. I don't. I don't know that. I mean, he, we we just talked to him yesterday. I think it's fine. I think we we let, let me finish here. Um, you want me to let him go? Uh, yeah, I think so. Got it. Okay. 
I like Michael, but he's a frequent caller. So <laughs> if it were a new caller, they would get more priority. He was just on the show yesterday. So you ready to answer my tough questions? Got sure. it already. All okay. <laughs> We're gonna have to do them all in about four minutes. Okay. We'll start with the court and what they can do, and then move to what individuals can do. Sure. And political answers, but also if there are places to donate or sure. you know who's helping these people both legally and you know the people giving them sustenance, whatever. And now, the voice of reason in an unreasonable world, Mark Levine. Ready, Mark? Ready. Here you go. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. Just a few minutes left on this very important topic. If you haven't heard by now, the Trump administration has been ordered to reunite every single family they separated, the thousands of children kept away from their parents. The deadline is today, and by all accounts, they're not going to meet it. My guest is Claudia Flores. She is the uh, immigrant campaign manager for the Center for American Progress. She's right here in studio with me. And um, Claudia, so tomorrow when uh, the Trump administration appears before the court and they shrug their shoulders and say, hey, judge, we got a thousand of them. There's still 2000 that aren't or whatever the final numbers are. I suspect there'll be more than a thousand kids not reunited with their parents. What can the judge do? What do you think the judge will do? How do you force a government official to comply with the law? So, so the challenge and the, and the answer that you might not like is that, you know, we simply will not know until that happens. So, um, you know, it seems unlikely uh, from my understanding that, you know, the judge may hold the government in contempt. That didn't happen when the government failed its first deadline. Uh, but um, in this case, the ACLU, which is leading this lawsuit, um, you know, would depending on what they're requesting, they may find ways that they can. I know the judge asked the ACLU specifically to lay out what they think the punishment should be. Do you know what the ACLU is asking for? So I, I do not. Okay. Um, I, I do not. But I do know that the ACLU has also requested a stay of, of deportation of these parents. One of the things that That's the um, least that, they, that they, they were trying to do, and we were very afraid that they were going to do, um, is to speed the deportations of families once they've been reunified. So the ACLU right now, uh, from my understanding, is focused on provision of information, details about who these parents that were deported, um, you know, what do we know about them. Um, and we are also going to see the need for, you know, uh, for more reunifications, you know, that happened when the government, you know, failed its first deadline. There were still parents that were going through the process of, of reuniting with their kids. So, um, so, so there are a lot of things um, that, so is the that ACLU could, leading the way here. Are they the main lawyers in charge? Are there other immigration lawyers that are jumping up? Um, how, how is this being handled? So, so there are pro bono attorneys that are dealing with uh, cases of families that were impacted. The ACLU is the one that brought forth the cl the class action on behalf of separated their the parents, and they were the ones that won this decision bearing so the family separation. If someone's listening right now and wants to help. What should they do? Give the ACLU, give to immigration lawyers, give to certain charities that are actually helping. I mean, it takes a lot of work to do the detective work to find out where the parents are, where the kids are, and reunite them. Are there groups that are doing that? Yes. So so a couple of ways to get engaged. So uh, donations. Donations are definitely appreciated. There are different groups that are working on this. The ACLU has the lawsuit, but there are many groups. If you from a simple search, like organizations that are doing this. I mean, Raices has been the one that has received R -A -I -C -E -S. tons of donations. Yes, Raices, but there are groups like the Asylum Advocacy uh, Seeking Project, uh, the Florence Project. Uh, I mean, in Virginia, the Virginia, um, I'm blanking out right now, but the Virginia Legal Aid. Um, I know there's they, the Association they, of Immigration they, Attorneys. Uh, they, they're, they're doing you know, some of this work. I mean, I think it depends by community. But another uh, important way to donate is flights for families. So one of the challenges, flights, flights for, for families. Family. F-L-I-G-H-T-S. So, yes, flights, flights for, for families. families. So go on there. Um, you know, these are funds that are being used to assist families in the reunification. Uh, what's even more disturbing is that the government has failed to, in some cases, provide transportation. I mean, families are now going to have to present themselves in court, right? Remember that their legal right. cases so have still to be. Have to fly so private there. groups are assisting so us. We're, we're running out of time. 
politically, what can we do? Politically. So next week, very important. So next week, the Senate is going to have an ICE hearing. Um, and I think it's important for people to be calling their senators. I mean, the House right now just passed an appropriations bill for the Department of Homeland Security, which is in charge of, of this process. Ten seconds left. Call your call senator, your senator call your member and of Congress, call your member and of tell Congress them, and tell them to stop funding, um, you know, these family separations. Stop uh, funding family and, separations. And, and to keep DHS accountable. All right. Well, you heard it here. Uh, boy, an hour goes fast. This is a very troubling situation. It's a stain. Sustain on American history, the American people. This is Mark Levine signing off. And thank you, thank Claudia you, Flores, for coming here. Great show, you guys. That was excellent. Yeah, it went very quickly.